Okay, uh, well, Peter, one of the things that, that um, we, we have this opportunity being here at the uh, at CIN, the Centro Internacional Miranda, um, to talk about a lot of questions, you know, the whole issue of the Bolivarian Revolution, um, radical pedagogy, uh, Marxism, etc., like that, and it's, it's a good opportunity to explore these questions. And one of the most interesting questions, it seems to me, you know, when, when people look at uh, Venezuela is, some of the unique characteristics of the Bolivarian Constitution, this whole emphasis on the full development of human potential, um, that uh, everyone should have the opportunity to, to develop their potential, their full personality, and also um, the recognition that this can only occur through practice, through, through participation, that that's, it's a necessary condition. And one of the things that strikes me from the little I know about you know your work in radical pedagogy, uh, that seems to me that this is a, exactly the same kind of the focus. I don't know whether you, know, you want to explore that. Certainly, um, the aspects of the constitution here in Venezuela that we mentioned are remarkable in the sense that they reflect um, a Deweyan, Frarian uh, approach to learning through self-activity. Um, and of course, in addition to uh, you know the, the stress on human development and, and capacity building and self-organization and uh, in self-realization, creativity, and capacity building, etc. Um, there's obviously a um, a revolutionary trajectory here, which which in, in history and um, which sort of adds to the um, the whole exercise of what it means to be from the critical aging um, for self and social transformation. So to me, the, the interesting and the, the important aspect of the Bolivarian Constitution is its emphasis on self and social empowerment. So you can't have self empowerment without social empowerment. You can't have social empowerment without self, self empowerment. So there's, a, I think, an intrinsic dialectic in it, which uh, is absolutely worth exploring and I think necessary for, um, for people to, to examine and uh, use as an example for constitution building. Uh, constitution, you know, from what I can see, you know, um, was like a snapshot uh, at, at the moment of that, you know, of the process mm -hmm. because it contained these elements which I see as enormously subversive of capitalist society. Um, but at the same time, you know, Focused on um, the you know private sector being maintained, uh, the bank having you know uh, in central bank having independence, you know, so it, it reflect it was sort of caught between you know yeah. capitalism and, and and the undermining of capitalism. But when you look at this second that part of the undermining of capitalism, it, it seems you know really incompatible to have you know if, if the constitution really means something, you know, and so many constitutions don't mean anything, uh, then it has to involve the creation of institutions which empower people. No, I mean, there is a self-contradictory aspect to it, of course, and I think that's, that to me is, the, is, 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 is where critical pedagogy comes in. I mean, that to me is, is, is something that um, can address the unlocking of this potential for revolutionary uh, ends, and um, and that requires you know, pedagogical approach in the Constitution to to unleash revolutionary potential in a document which, in, in some levels, uh, appears to be you know to, to contain a, a you know a fundamental contradiction. Um, so that, to me, is a challenge of a pedagogical approach. To Constitution and how to build from the Constitution as the Bolivarian Revolution proceeds in pace. Two questions in my mind. One yeah. is, um, is the are these kinds of elements that you can see mm -hmm. you know, in the Constitution, are they, to your knowledge, being embodied in the edu educational process now here in Venezuela? Well, I you know, I that's one question for you. I, I wish I, I I wish I, I 
good answer to that question more adequately. From what I've seen in the limited uh, times that I've come here, uh, and at the Bolivarian uh, University, uh, as, one in, as one example, and in some of the missions, the missions, the educational missions, uh, as other examples, I would say that yes, um, that the, uh, the education that's attempted to get um, you know, some kind of traction and momentum uh, does reflect fundamentally the question of capacity building, um, self-organization, self-activity, learning through doing, but beyond the doing in sense of you know, just learning through doing, learning through doing anything, but learning to engage in projects um, which build community, learning to engage in projects uh, which speak to uh, questions uh, much larger than individual self-interest, uh, learning um, you know, to think collectively uh, for the greater good of, um, of, of the social uh, order. And that's something that's uh, absolutely uh, remarkable for what I've seen uh, so far. visits to uh, missions and the I mean, I had a, a meeting with the rector today at the Bolivarian University uh, with my compañero uh, Metaliano Mio, uh, who, uh, uh, you know, who was uh, with me speaking um, to some of the teachers, some of the teacher educators at the university. And the conversation we had with this rector about the mission was, was, I, mean, I wish I had recorded it mm -hmm. because it was um, it just contained uh, the seedbed of all one could wish for when one thinks of the purpose of a institution um, learning um, reaching out into the communities um, teachers uh, working in spaces which may not, in fact, even have sufficient lighting, working in people's homes, taking the university, taking the professors, taking the classes to different parts of the country, and, uh, and working in a way in which, which really reflects a lot of uh, the best of uh, what Paulo Freire is talking about. He's talking about cultural circles, starting with students' experiences, building with those experiences, and yet challenging the, the students um, to rethink those experiences and to uh, revisit their own self-formation uh, using uh, some of the ideas that have been uh, won from historical struggles in the present and in the past to really build a revolutionary society. And, and you know, so I was, I was, I mean, I was sitting there thinking, where could we find uh, an administrator, a president of a of a university that could, you know, in, in the space of 15 minutes, convey that spirit uh, to to uh, to visitors? I I see from the little I've seen at the Bolivarian University, I have the same exact sense. Yes. Although I, I think that you know. Probably appreciated the things that you were hearing much more than I, because uh, you know, it's not an area for me. But I wonder if this is unique. You know, for example, if we look at the the education at the lower level. Yeah. I mean, certainly one of the things that's been clear is an enormous increase in inclusion. Mm -hmm. But has the structure of education changed? Yeah. Um, you know, and one of the things I know that. Um, some people have raised is the problem of teaching by video. Yeah. yeah. Uh, because video, and I know this is a criticism that Canadian professors that I know have come about Cuba, have yeah. said about yeah. Cuban video teaching, which is it's inherently this delivery of not packaged knowledge. Uh, so is that possible? Is that consistent with radical pedagogy? Yeah, and, and I, it's interesting. I've, I've had the opportunity to see a number of classes using videos, but I haven't been able to really ascertain at this point, um, you know, uh, 
how those videos uh, are always used, how they could be used. I think videos in and of themselves aren't necessarily incompatible with radical pedagogy. It depends upon how those videos are used and whether they're the only medium of instruction. Uh, I mean, I use videos all the time, very critically in my classes. Um, so I haven't had a chance to really come to any kind of definitive you know, conclusion. But, uh, but the larger question of if the videos, in fact, are simply used to transmit knowledge, and the question of knowledge is left, you know, um, un under-challenged, uh, and not, you know, with, without any kind of uh, critical reflection, without any kind of dialogue about what they've learned, um, if, there's, if there's no uh, opportunities to question what they've seen and what they've heard and to ask further questions and to make links to other contexts, then those videos could be, uh, you know, very uh, standard form of cultural transmission and critical pedagogy is always for deep. It, 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 again, it depends. Uh, in and of themselves, those videos aren't necessarily problematic. Um, if, it, you know, one can engage those videos in a very critical self course way. I think there's a potential to do that. Whether that's being done or not, I tend to think that uh, it's probably not done uh, simply because um, the teachers and instructors who are volunteers might not have a grounding in popular education, dialogical education, Freudian education, and uh, they may not be aware of um, the dangers of simply transmitting knowledge, which is a Freire's concept of bank of banking education. Well, you know, I, I mentioned I had two questions that yeah. linked to the Constitution, and one of them sort of changing as, as you've been talking. Uh -huh. The, you know, the Constitution, uh, with its focus on human development and human development only through, through practice, mm -hmm. uh, one of the questions that comes to mind is it seems to me that um, the Constitution itself can be, in Venezuela, a major teaching device yeah. because it raises these questions that people embrace and see, they see the importance of this in the Constitution. And so it means, it means that it should be possible to introduce ideas of, of critical pedagogy here much more easily than in a society where those concepts have not been introduced. North America, for example, is a society where those concepts are foreign. And so, and you could raise these questions by talking about Marx. Yeah. Um, and say, well, Marx talks about human development, and this is the central core of his argument, the whole issue of, of um, revolutionary practice, the simultaneous changing of circumstances, and self-change. Um, but, of course, Marx is a hard sell in North America. But the question is, could the Bolivarian Constitution, with its the things it's raising, could that be something that would facilitate these kinds of thoughts in North America? Absolutely. You know, one of the things that uh, that I noticed when I was visiting uh, uh, Mission Mercado, which is you know, the food collectors, is that um, packages of sugar, packages of flour, packages of rice, they have excerpts from them from the Venezuelan Constitution. They have lines and phrases from the Venezuelan Constitution on those staple roads to remind people uh, that this is a rich resource uh, and that, you know, the very food that they're able to eat in these, in these, um, you know, in these collectives, uh, you know, are inextricably linked to the values and practices that exist in the Constitution. And I found that a very interesting pedagogical device. Mm -hmm. uh, as a matter of fact, what I did was I purchased them, I purchased a lot of food uh, at the mission and then uh, repackaged them and gave the food away but kept the, <laughs> kept, kept the packaging uh, just because I, found, I wanted to show my students when I got back to the United States. But of course, in the United States, where I'm Canadian, um, but I uh, you know, have been citizenship. Um, and uh, but one of the uh, 
one of the interesting things about living in the United States since 1985 is my, my sense that uh, you know, human rights is something that uh, people talk about, uh, but they rarely ever link human rights to economic rights. Economic rights is, as, is seen as um, antithetical to democracy because they see it as giving something to somebody for nothing. In other words, you know, handouts for to lazy people who sit around and watch TV and eat, eat cornflakes or whatever and uh, all the more uh, twink, twink, you know, Twinkies or whatever. I mean, it's, there's, this, there's this real sense that economic rights um, are, are not really part of the broad umbrella. And I think that uh, whereas in the Constitution, the Venezuelan Constitution, of course, I still have so much to learn about that Constitution. Um, but my sense is that uh, there's a fundamental opportunity uh, to talk about human rights as economic rights and as the right to live up to your creative capacity and the importance of creating, A, the cultural forms, the organizational, you know, institutional forms that will enable that kind of creativity to flourish. And so um, it's really quite a dialectical process because we talk about cultural forms, you know, social structures, institutional formations, and human capacity certain kind of human capacities to able us to imagine what those kind of formations might look like and those formations by the same token help us to um, to create a very thick and uh, you know, rich form of uh, you know, creative energies and so yeah I think that uh, the constitution here is something that um, could could serve as as a, as a, a major you know Discursive vehicle for our pedagogical efforts. Yeah, absolutely. There's a question I wanted to get yeah. into, which is the yeah. issue of socialism. Yeah. Um, certainly, you know, when we talk about the question of human development and how it requires, you know, uh, the the full participation of, of people, or the yeah. ending, for example, of the, the division between thinking and doing. Yes. Um, the hierarchical structure uh, within society and within industry, mm -hmm. um, then a, a central aspect of that has to be uh, a process of self-management within industry mm -hmm. and self-government within societies, within communities, etc. We look at the history of, of socialism of the 20th century. Yeah. These patterns are not things you find. Yes. Um, to some extent, it, you could see it in, in Yugoslavia and the self-managed enterprises. Yes. But you know there there were real limitations as to you know what was happening there. It was very much a, a process which was limited to the self-management within specific enterprises rather than a concept of looking at society as a whole. But the question is, you know, um, don't we see then um, the, the incompatibility of some of these ideas about human development and and uh, and through activity with some of the practices that occurred in the 20th, in 20th century efforts at building socialism? Well, that's a really interesting question. I mean, I was thinking here of the, um, talk about Yugoslavia, but of course there's the well-known Patas, right? Here, mm -hmm. that occurred with, with, which was an interesting thing to hear, but you might want to talk about um, a little bit, because I'm sure you know more about that than I do. But you're right, so did you, I mean, you're right if, if, if what I understand you're saying is that, you know, the attempts to create socialism in the past uh, have contradicted um, you know, Marx's understanding of, uh, of the flourishing of human capacities and creative self-activity, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, you're saying, so we need to learn what went wrong, where the incompatibilities were historically, right? and, and look for new specific ways here in Venezuela at this historical moment where we have the opportunity that might in fact um, that might in fact be more faithful to that 
in our city. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, definitely. I, I mean, I see yeah. that there, and certainly we look, look at Marx, we yeah. see this, this thread that runs through him from his earliest writing about revolutionary practice to sure. his discussion of the commune and the Absolutely. people are constantly, will have to go through 10, 20, 30 That's years right. of 50 years That's of right. civil war, not only to change circumstances, but to change themselves, yes. to make themselves fit you know, for this new society. You, and you see that thread also in Rosa Luxemburg right. yes. and in her criticism of the, the, the structure of the, of the vanguard party right. when she talks about the working class demands the right to make its own mistakes right. and to learn from the dialectic of history. And, and you see it here, I think, yeah. as, as well. Uh, and, and, and in Yugoslavia, I think there were some kinds of tendencies there. Uh, certainly, one of the people who influenced me quite a bit was a, a Yugoslav philosopher, Gajo Petrovic, mm -hmm. um, who talks about human beings as beings of praxis. And I noticed that uh, Freire quotes yeah. him as well. I mean, it was very important, this whole emphasis on the being of praxis. Yes. That's so central. Well, you know, it's interesting. I mean, I, I, I conceptually, it's, it's, it, it, it makes sense for me uh, to think about it in, in uh, philosophical terms. So, again, you know, as a Marxist humanism, uh, uh, I like to think of, of critical pedagogy as developing the philosophy. Revolutionary philosophy, perhaps. And I think that um, one of the insights I certainly gleaned from my engagement with Marxist humanism and Marxist humanist theorizing and thinking and practice has been that the whole concept of um, absolute which is really grounded in Marx, which is uh, not just mere, mere negative, um, but, you know, if you want to follow you know, uh, you know, the Hegelian trope, it suggests um, the negation of the negation, that is to say, uh, you just don't negate capital. You just don't negate, rather, capitalism. You negate capital as a social relation, and absolute negation means and entails and encompasses the articulation of something completely new. So that within this, the concept of that absolute negative is the positive of, of an alternative capitalist value form. And they very often, it's interesting to look at past revolutions because it seems that they never really went past the initial negation. Uh, you know, absolute negativity talks about, well, not just, you know, getting rid of capitalism as a social relation, but asking questions like, what kind of world do we want to build? What are the social relations we want? What are the kind of relations we want between men and women? What are the kind of relations that are we trying to find between workers, between, you know, the question of management, the question of self-management, the question of cooperation? What kind of human relations are we looking for? And so, revolution ceases to simply become, you know, the question of, you know, you know taking you know, power and, you know, working through the state, but it becomes a question of, you know, a revolution of human values. I know that, well, I know, I know some of the literature of the yeah. Marxist humanist, you know, uh, work of yeah. writing of Sky, etc., which I read quite a bit of uh, in my own development. Yeah. Uh, and it seems that basically what you are saying there is that um, the, the flaw in much of the, the Marxist and socialist thinking mm -hmm. has been the incomplete transcendence of capitalism, uh, like Hegel's Bad Infinity. Yeah. Um, that it, you know, which con continues to contain within it the old society right. and does not go beyond. That's right. um, so maybe a transcending of capital, right. but not a transcending of wage labor. Uh, the, that that yes, right. you have the workers exactly. still in this position of wage labor in relationship to a state, right. but not you know right. a, a person for himself. And if you look at you know, go back to Marx's, yeah. well, the 1844 manuscript, yeah. when he talks about Feuerbach, 
Yeah. Um, and he looks at Feuerbach and says, Feuerbach, you know, uh, is presents us with the real positive. That real positive is man, the human being. Mm -hmm. um, and that brings us then, that's I think part of Marx's whole process of, of coming to human development as the key. Although when he does this, it's human development not in the passive sense of Feuerbach, but he incorporates Hegel's concept of the self-development of the idea, but he says that Hegel grasps you know, that people create themselves through their own activity, but Hegel only understood mental activity. That's right. Well, it, exactly. So it's a question of what traditional Marxists have seen as the positive. And so very often tradi uh, traditional Marxists, after revolutions, have seen the positive as, you know, uh, collective labor as opposed to collective, uh, you know, co sort of collective economic re relationships, collective capital as opposed to, say, you know, more individualized forms of capital. But you're still talking about, you know, you're still operating within the social um, value within capitalism. And so you're precisely right on that issue, that um, we need to transcend the value form of mediation. And attempts to do that um, were very um, meager um, and were not taken seriously. So I think that one of the questions that one might begin with uh, is why have so many revolutions turned into bureaucracy? And I think that's a fundamental question to begin with because I think that will help answer some of the questions that you raised about well, what are the obstacles and why haven't revolutions in the past been able to transcend this, you know, um, the value from uh, labor wage labor, uh, and, uh, and I think that that's a crucial question. I think, you know, I'm going to come back to Rosa Luxemburg, yeah. the same thing with the, uh, where, where she talked about the working class demands the right to make it, yeah. its own mistakes, because she also proceeded to continue and, and say um, that the errors of a true working class movement are infinitely more fruitful right. than the correct decisions of an infallible central committee. That's right. And, and I think one of the issues is that often those at the top have been afraid yeah. to let people make mistakes and learn in the process because they want to engage in what is, you know, in the Soviet Union became known as petty tutelage. Well, you know, one of the things that I think it comes back to pedagogy. You know, it's interesting. I was thinking about the first the first coup attempt uh, by China. And when he negotiated uh, with the government uh, and negotiated 30 seconds spot on point, as I understand it, uh, and I may get the details wrong here, but uh, you know, where he basically took responsibility and said, you know, we have failed for now to do this. And he assumed responsibility for, for what went wrong. When there was that at least, and, and that really stuck with the people in Venezuela. I mean, people remember Chavez as some humility, uh, but he also had that place for now. If, uh, but, for now but, but I take responsibility for that. So, I mean, I think that, that there is this sense of, of being self critical and enabling oneself to be self critical and understand that, um, that uh, because someone makes mistakes or group makes groups make mistakes, that that's part of the learning process, and that's part of moving forward. And uh, there's a reluctance, I think, in the whole psychology and, and of leadership, uh, the whole politics of leadership, to, to, uh, to appear to have any weak spots or any vulnerabilities, of course, and that's just tragic for any kind of revolutionary self-movement. Um, that could happen here still. Yeah. But, you know, uh, I think you would agree with me yeah. in that when you look at the Constitution, when you look at the some of the measures taken, like uh, the development of the communal councils, mm -hmm. uh, when you look at um, Chavez's real concern mm -hmm. that you, you know, develop a, a new moral, you know, to move That's away right. from uh, self-interest and right. to focus on the needs of society, the needs of community, that there is here a potential that we haven't seen before 
for a long time. We haven't seen it for a long time, and it really reminds me, and resonates with a lot of Che Guevara was all about as well. You know, with the, 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 you know, the, the new man, the, 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 I, like, I prefer to say the new human, um, but absolutely, I mean, there is that sense of, of you know, the, 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 the constitution of the self, the, 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 the um, and I'm not speaking about that in the Foucauldian mm -hmm. sense, but just that sense of developing what is communist morality? Or what is socialist morality? Uh, and uh, what does it mean um, to develop a, 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 a practical ethics of everyday life which goes beyond one's own sense of self interest, um, where one's own self interest is connected to the larger social totality? And this is all sort of a movement that uh, I mean, it isn't a kind of, you know, it isn't simply a mantra uh, that's, you know, used uh, you know, in a propagandistic way by a revolutionary leadership, but it actually is a motivating force uh, that gives ballast uh, to this sense of self movement. And, uh, very, very resonant of, of change. That was, um, you know, when, when I studied for years uh, the process in Yugoslavia, yeah. I mean, it was so exciting to see, you know, the process of self-management. This mm -hmm. is why I was attracted to look at Yugoslavia. Yeah. Um, but all of that occurred within the context of, you know, the focus on self-interest. A collective self-interest, the interest yeah. of the workers within a particular yeah. enterprise. They didn't care anything about workers in other enterprises, mm -hmm. or about the community itself. And furthermore, they competed against each other. And this was one of the things that Che looked at in the Yugoslav experience and said, well, you know, it's important to see that the, the, the income generated by these uh, firms is divided up among the workers, not capitalists, but still, their work, they're competing against each other, and how is that consistent with the socialist spirit? That's right. And, and, and that gets to the core of the question of what is, what is the goal, what's the purpose? Um, right. And to try to focus on self-interest, you know, um, that when you do that, you focus on, you create the conditions for the restoration of capitalism, even if you've gotten rid of all the private ownership of capital. Well, what's the, again, I would say, what's the difference between collective self-interest of a factory and the collective self-interest of a bourgeois class? I mean, it's still... Well, because the first, well, the first is the workers are doing right. it, the second is they're exploiting yeah. it. But it's within, the same, it's, it's, it's within the same sort of commodity logic. I mean, obviously, you know, there's a difference, but, you know, ultimately in terms of the kind of, in, in, in terms of the kind of, you know, logic, social logic, that informs that. I mean, it's the, the, the question is, well, you know, this is our I mean, world group, and uh, and you know, and we we are looking out for our own interests as a group against this group. So there's a similarity in social logic, I think, that has to be explored. But uh, but yeah, I mean, that's something that you know the Venezuelan experience can look at. Profit from the limitations of that kind of social logic, because that kind of social logic still op operates within, you know, a particular value form, which, in fact, if taken to its, uh, you know, logical endpoint, uh, again does serve for the reproduction, you know, of, 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 of uh, you know, existing social relations. Well, you know, the the. Um when you talk about self-interest and you know, people are related yeah. to each other as self as self-interested, they are effect, you know, effectively viewing their their capacities, their abilities as their property. Yeah. Uh, and so they then engage in this process of exchange with each other. I will do this for sure. you if you do this sure. for me. Um, and if you don't do enough for me, I'm not going to do very much sure. for you. Um, and one of the things that uh, is interesting in here is right. that um, a person who was very critical of this was uh, Islam Lazarus uh -huh. in his book Beyond Capital, yes. drawing upon Marx's Grundrisse. Yeah. And um, Islam you know, cites over and over again this passage of, of um, 
Marx, which says well, you, you, know, you have to have not an exchange of commodities, but rather an exchange of activity, of human activity based on communal needs and purposes. And that phrase is what Chavez has grasped. Right. And he repeats it over and over again. And that's the whole concept sure. of this new model that he wants to introduce and, and uh, encourage. And this is really quite remarkable. I mean, speaking of being on capital, I don't know how many years it took me to get through that book uh, by Saros. But you know, you're right. It's uh, um, that passage of Marx has been crucial uh, in terms of the way the revolution has been you know, articulated here by Chavez. And I just, um, I mean, again, I mean, I was listening to your talk the other day, I thought where you talked about the uniqueness of socialism in Venezuela. And um, I don't think, I mean, there's a lot of people within the socialist tradition that don't like that term unique about the socialism. So you think that socialism is certain that, that sense of unique suggests is sort of contradictory to you know, the whole idea of socialism. But I think it really is you know, really important when you talked about the uniqueness of this experiment here in Venezuela. Now you, you know, spend I guess most of your time pretty much most of your time. I mean, I, I'm just, I, I'm curious as to how you see um, the lifespan of this experiment. One of the things I've you know, come to conclude, both from my studies of mm -hmm. Soviet economy and the Eastern European economies, which I taught 30 years or so, and from my experience in, in Venezuela, is a complete rejection of determinism. Mm -hmm. This will be settled by struggle, mm -hmm. um, and it, there are no guarantees. Mm -hmm. um, and um, what we can do here is to, you know, and hopefully in your work here on pe radical pedagogy, is important here, uh, that what we can do is try to strengthen the, the side of those who are struggling for this new humanistic socialism. This new humanism, yes.